There's a stranger at the door. Let him in. Let him in. He has been there off before. Let him in. Let him in. Let him in ere he is gone. Let him in, the Holy One, Jesus Christ. God, Father, Son, let him in. Let him in. Amen. He ought not to be a stranger to any of us. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. This is our third day of our, our revival. And uh, by, by way of testimony, I won't take a whole lot of time, but I do need to say this. Last week, I was so low. I almost called Pastor Pete and I said, you know, maybe you need to get somebody else to this revival because I need reviving. And it wasn't until after I preached Sunday morning that God gave me a little revival. Amen. The book of Habakkuk talks about being having a little revival. And every message I've been getting more and more and more. I'm not done yet, folks. And my cup needs to be filled. And we're going to trust God to do that. I can't do that, but God can. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome our guests on behalf of our church, not only the uh, Calvary Chapel, I mean Calvary Heights, but also the folks who are not members. And praise the Lord that you did come out tonight and you chose to be here. A special welcome to uh, Calvary Heights. I had the pleasure of fellowshipping with them this past November. And I want to let you know, I grew very, very fond of that church, myself and my family. You treated us very, very well. We won't forget that. We look forward to being with you uh, this coming November, once again, at the Lord Terry's. Amen. Um, our opening prayer. Father, strengthen us with might by your spirit in the inner man. That Christ might dwell or abide in our hearts by faith. Jesus, in speaking to the church age today, you said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup or have fellowship with him. And he with me. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Father, I hear you speaking to the church today concerning this abiding relationship. God, there's many that's not hearing you, my Lord. There's times I'm not hearing you. Oh, God, open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. Please, we pray in Jesus' name. Take time. 
time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to see. Take time to be holy be calm in thy soul each thought and each motive beneath his control thus led by his spirit to fountains of love Thou soon shall be fitted for service above. You know, many of our evangelists have been accused of giving stale bread. <laughs> and we certainly need to be careful not to do that. I said that in, in respect to the message I'm preaching tonight. I've preached this message before, but never the same way. And never with the same effect. Amen. This message has been preached to me. And last time I was with you folks, I, I preached this similar message. Amen. But you'll find that it's just what the doctor talking about the great physician ordered. We need this word. I need this word. Amen. Let's be prepared to receive it. By way of introduction. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus and the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 to 17, the Lord commands his people, his children, to be holy as he is holy. Amen? What is true holiness? According to Ephesians 4, and I'm, I'm not going to those verses for the sake of time, amen? Most of us are familiar with those verses. And I'm only going to flip only as I hear the Holy Spirit telling me to flip. Amen? And so anyhow, uh, what is true holiness? According to Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 24 true holiness is best defined as a person the bible says to put on righteousness and true holiness amen there's a difference between man's holiness and god's holiness man's holiness is self-righteousness okay you know where i'm at with this amen true holiness is best defined as a per person true holiness is christ likeness he is God's living standard for holiness. Amen. He is, the, he is holy, harmless, undefiled. He is separate from sinners. He is the Holy One of God. He is without sin. Hebrews 4.15. There's no sin on him. Ours. Amen. And it was now. Praise the Lord. He knew no sin, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I, unlike us, in his humanity, 100% God, he was physically born without a sin nature by the seed of mankind. He was physically born supernaturally of a virgin impregnated by the seed of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that God the Father's ultimate vision, goal, or purpose is to make us holy as He is, His Son is, and His Spirit is holy, according to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and verse 29? Maybe we need to turn to those verses, though they are familiar. Romans 8, 28 and 29. I ask you a question, how many of you know? Well, the Bible says we know, we know. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow or know beforehand, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. How many of you know today that uh, uh, primarily God's purpose for saving us 
primarily is not just to save us from hell, it's to conform us to the image of his son. I asked uh, Brother Louie, I said, you know, what do you think is uh, his primary reason for saving us? He said, for the glory of God. And he's absolutely right. But I'm, I want to add to that and say this. No one or nothing glorifies God more than his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. He can and will do it. What? He can and he will conform us, those who he has saved, to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the word of God. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says that uh, he that had begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, he's in the process of doing that now. If you're saved day by day by his spirit, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18, whether you believe it or not. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. We don't like his method of doing things. Because we don't like suffering through things. But that's part of the process. He that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Are you with me now? How is he going to do it? Well, he's doing it. He does it through uh, sanctification. What is sanctification? I'm glad you asked. Sanctification is God's process of saving us by setting us apart from the world, the flesh, and the devil for the purpose of making us holy. His process is defined in three stages. Now stay with me. I know that you know these things. First stage is we, we consider positional sanctification. In other words, the moment you get saved, God performs a, an operation, a spiritual operation... Where he saves you and places you in the spiritual body of Christ. As a consequence, he sees you already in Christ. He sees you holy. He sees you Christ-like. Because God is not bound by time. He sees it, the transaction already done. He sees us seated in heavenly places Amen. with him. The third stage, and I skipped the second one on purpose because that's what we're going to talk about now. Today. Today. The third stage of sanctification we call uh, perfect sanctification. And that's when God, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when he comes back to meet the saints in the air, right before the great tribulation, he's going to change us into the image of Christ in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Amen? He's going to do it. He can do it. Consider it done. The second stage of the sanctification is a stage in which we live in today. Right now. We are a work in progress. We haven't arrived. And the only way that we can be like Christ in this day and age, today, is to allow him to live his life through us, day by day, to abide in him, or to continue, to begin, and then continue to remain in close fellowship with him until he enables you to bear the only fruit his spirit produces the fruit of the spirit, which is the likeness of Jesus Christ. God can do it. And that's what God is looking for today. I asked some folks the other day, they felt like I had uh, set them up. I said, you know, listen, how many of you are ready for Jesus to come back? And the many people that raised their hand and I said, you know, what? I tell you what, if you are, you are part of the minority, you're not part of the majority. Because Jesus characterized this age in which we live in, this Laodicean church age, as the saints, for the most part. Now, there's always a remnant, a part of the few, a few of the, uh, of the many, who have not bowed their knee to Baal. 
who have not bowed their heart to self. Who have, who daily die to self and invite Jesus, not only to be, because he's resident, invite him to be president. To rule and reign over our hearts. And if you're not one of those, you're not going to be ready when he returns. It's something that we need to do daily as Christians. Another dynamic is this. He's not only speaking to uh, saved folks in that portion of scripture and revelation. He's talking to unsaved folks as well. To, for the saved, at least he's resident. He may not be president. Because Laodicean church and the spirit of that age says that, that uh, the people rule, not Jesus. But for the lost person, he's not even resident. He's not living in you. And so when he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, he's not only knocking, but he's always calling you. He says, any man, anyone in mankind, any person, I'm calling you by name. Open the door. And let him in. Do you hear the call? And it's not something that we need to do once or twice. We need to do it daily. If we are to abide or to continue to remain in close fellowship with him. Until he enables us to bear the fruit of his likeness. In this second stage of sanctification. Are you still with me saints? Okay. Stay with me. How many of you know? How many of you are ready? And if you are ready, and if you already know these things that I'm telling you, why are there, why are there so many of us that are not about me? Why are there so, listen, folks everywhere is looking for Jesus. And the only Jesus they're going to see is you and I who, who name the name of Christ. We're looking for Jesus in our home, our family. My, my wife and my grandchildren are looking for Christ in me every day. And sometimes they're disappointed. Oh my Lord. And my wife will let me know. I said, I'm looking for him in you too. <laughs> I let her know. People on the job, your neighbors, um, uh, we're talking about everybody in the sphere of your influence. They're looking for Christ. And unless we're abiding in him, we're not going to see him. Are you with me, saints? There's a stranger at the door. Let him in. Let him in. He has been there off before. Let him in. Let him in. The theme for our series of messages is re reviving a right relationship with the Lord, if necessary. And some of you might say, well, I don't need revival. <laughs> That's not me. The title for our series of messages, all, all the messages I've preached this week is what a fellowship. Fellowship meaning uh, the mutual sharing of your life with Christ and him sharing his life with you. Our theme, our, our, our text is, uh, it has been and is 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now little children abide in him that you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Are you gonna be confident and without shame when he comes? Be honest with yourself. The Apostle Paul, and listen, it, it, it took him almost a lifetime to learn how to be content. Or to learn through life's experiences how to just simply rest in the Lord. He, one of his greatest testimonies is, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's his way of defining that abiding relationship. It's preached all the way through the words, a different word of God, but in different ways. Because the essence of Christianity is, listen, let, him, let me live my life through you. Come on, somebody. 
And so Paul said, I am, I am, I am ready for my departure. Even though he wasn't talking about a rapture because he, he wasn't here before the rapture, but he was ready to meet his Lord. I am ready for my departure. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Therefore, the Lord has laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And for all those who love his appearing, couldn't wait, looking, living a life that is characterized by a being ready when Jesus comes back. How are we doing? The, the, the thought for our message tonight, and this is a subtitle. For the nice message is how to abide. It, it, you know, it's, we, 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 if you're going to talk about what we need to do, we need to talk about how to do it. And so that's what we chose to do tonight. And I want to illustrate, not, not because this is what I'm doing, but this is what God has called me to preach. And what I need to be done. I don't only need to herald this message. I need to heed it. Amen? I want to illustrate... How? And for those of us who, if this is stale bread for you, do yourself a favor and take inventory. How are you doing? Amen. How to abide. Boy, I love the hymns. Some of them you can preach from. And I'd like to try to preach from take time to be holy. I won't keep you long. But let me give you some insight. Take Time to be holy, speak, take time to be holy, or take time to be like Christ. Takes time with him. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always. And feed on his word. You can cross-reference that part of that song with John chapter 15. You can turn if you'd like. Verse 7. Where Jesus says this. If ye abide in me. And my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will. And it shall be done unto you. What is he, what is he speaking to? He's saying many things. We only got time to really maybe touch on it briefly. So let me just take a few moments to do that. He said if you abide in me. Or continue to remain in close fellowship with me. Christian. By continuing to walk in the light of my word. You can't separate the living word from the written word. Walk in the light as he is in the light. You might have fellowship one with another. See, listen, if you don't walk in the light of his word, you cannot have fellowship with the Lord. Jesus is holy. You have to be holy to walk with Jesus. He has to wash your feet. Otherwise, like Peter, he's going to tell you, listen, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no heart, no fellowship. You can't walk in darkness and abide in Christ. Are you with me? Let me give you a thought. <laughs> you need to read the word. You need to speak the word. You need to meditate on, memorize the word. You need to meditate on the word, then you need to apply it to your life. Doesn't that sound like Joshua 1.8? If you want to prosper and have good success in every area of your life. If you want to bear the fruit of Christ's likeness. Let me give you an example. Uh, I am the true vine, and my father is a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit. He purges it that it might bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Absolutely. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather him and cast him into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Here, here, or this is how my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. The fruit of Christ's likeness. And so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue my word. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide or continue to remain in my word. Even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his word. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might be in you and joy might be full. See, here's the point I'm trying to make is you, you got to read that word. You got to speak it. 
You got to meditate on it. You got to memorize it. The problem I have at times is applying. Daily. You talk about life verses, man. Are you with me? The second part of that, 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 that song says this. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children. Help those who are weak. Forget any nothing. Help make, how do you make friends with God's children? Jesus said in John chapter 15, he said, once again, as the Father has loved me, so has I loved, have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. How? If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy would be, remain in you, your joy would be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. You want to make friends with God's children, make friends with God? He goes on to say this. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. How do you make friends with God's children? How do you help those who are weak? You love them. You abide in his love. You love them the way that Christ does. You can't do that in the flesh. Listen, if you're not abiding in Christ, you cannot love the brethren the way Christ does. If you don't love the brethren, listen, you're out of fellowship. Why isn't the church hearing that today? And I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about me at times. I'm talking about my brother when I sit around hearing folks gossiping and, and saying, oh. I mean, we got all kinds of scenarios that we can, we can reference to really bring this truth home. Make friends with God's children. Help those who are weak. The, the best way to make friends is to lay down your life. To live for him, to die for him, because you love Jesus and Jesus is abiding in you. You don't do this in the flesh. You can't do this when self is seated on the throne of your heart. Come on, somebody. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak. Watch this. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to see. We can cross reference that to uh, Ephesians chapter, where it talks about Ephesians chapter one, I believe verse four, that you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know what, what you have in Christ? Do you know that God has promised you yet all things that you have in Christ Jesus? Count blessings and claim them. One by one. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to seek. Seek those blessings. The second verse says, take time to be holy, the world rushes on, spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. You want to, listen, you, by looking to Jesus, like him shalt thou be, thy friends and thy conduct the way that you live. His likeness shall see. The verse that really cross references that is, is Acts chapter 4. And the Holy Spirit said, Turn there. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to keep you here all night. I want you to know that. Be obedient to the Spirit, especially and to the pastor of this church. But we need to turn to this verse. We need to take time. Brother Louis, are you there? Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Would you read that for us, please? Loudly. The 
That's not the one. That's not the one I'm looking for. But we know the verse which says that, you know, that, that uh, uh, the apostles were following Jesus. They were abiding in him. They were taking residence with him. Amen. Not only individually, but collectively. They were taking time to be with the Lord. And the people observed that. You help me with this reference. And they said, listen, we've taken notice that these ignorant and unlearned men. Spent time with him. And it transformed their life. You see, there's nothing wrong with seminary if it's a good seminary. But you don't have to go to a seminary to learn how to abide in Christ. Until he lives his life through you. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. You can't be well, you can't be carnal. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone by looking to Jesus, keeping your eyes on him. Like him thou shalt be, thy friends and thy conduct, his likeness, and your enemies shall see. You won't have to tell anybody that you're abiding. They'll see it. Your neighbor will see it. Your wife, your wife and your husband, your children, your grandchildren. Everybody will see Christ in you. That ought to be our number one goal, our desire in life. Amen. The next verse says that, uh, take time to be holy. <laughs> Let him be thy guide. And run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. Whether you're on the mountaintop or the valley. Whether you're being persecuted, prosecuted, uh, in spite of people, places, predicaments, and pain. Still follow. I tell you, the, the, play, the verse that, that really, really speaks to that, that scripture is, the Lord is my shepherd. Pray something like this when you think about that portion of scripture. Now, this is just a suggestion. You pray any way you want. Lord, I acknowledge you as being my shepherd. And because you are my shepherd, Lord, I shall not want or lack anything. Because you are I am, and you are able to meet me at the place of every need. I can, I, 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 anything that I need, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, socially, and relationally. Please, Lord, help me to lie down in green pastures. Amen. Please, Lord, lead me beside the still waters. Please, Lord, restore my soul. Please help me to, to uh, 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 walk in the paths of righteousness for your great namesake. Oh, Lord. Even though there's times I feel like I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death in your eye. Lord, help me not to fear any evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Lord, you've even prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemy. When, the, when, the, when Satan comes in like a flood, you make him take a time out. And you say, listen, come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. I prepared a feast for you. Come and rest your soul for the rest of the journey. And not only that, well, I'll, I'll anoint, please anoint my head with the oil of the Holy Spirit. Fill me with your spirit. And help me to remember that as long as I follow you, goodness and mercy is going to follow me. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But right now, I want to dwell, I want to abide in you. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul, each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus, led by his spirit, two fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Listen, you can't abide in Christ apart from the spirit. That's why I opened up with that prayer. Lord, strengthen with, with might by your spirit and your man. So Christ may abide or dwell in my heart by faith. Fill me with your spirit. So that I might, Lord, I might bear the fruit of the spirit. Your love, your joy, your peace, your long suffering. That I might live, walk in the spirit, live in the spirit. Be surrendered, yielded to the spirit of God. That he might lead me to fountains of love. Your pastor talked about on your website that he wants his church to be characterized by the love of God only way. You must abide. You must abide. Mm. So in conclusion, 
Let me say this. And as much more as could be said, well, you can do what I just did on your own. Please do it. But I just hope you receive what God gave us tonight. How do you abide? Surrender. Christian, you got to surrender every day. He's resident, but he's got to be president. He will not take the seat of the throne of your heart. You have to give it to him. And, and listen, I, I know it's not easy. By experience, self wants to stay on, on the throne. I have anxiety issues at times because I won't surrender. I won't rest. I'm like, I'm still learning how to do that. It's part of the journey. And I glory in the infirmities as a result because I know that God is bringing me to that place of rest. And I see it by faith. But I've got to surrender. You're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to close with this thought before I ask Brother Louis just come and speak for a couple minutes on, on how, to get, how to be saved. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. He's not resident because you have never received him into your heart by faith. You, never, you have never believed enough. You believe, but you haven't believed enough to receive him yet because you're not saved. Even the devil believes, but he won't receive him. Listen, you don't want to be like the devil. You don't want to be in the devil's mind. You got to surrender. You got to, you listen, you got to surrender. You have to give your heart to Jesus. And allow him to dwell. You may not understand that, but by faith. Realize that he's standing at the door of your heart. And he's calling you by name. And he's saying, Mary, Linwood, Clifford, John, Tony, I'm standing there. Please surrender. Open your heart that I might come into you and be resident, Savior. But you won't. The reason why Jesus wants to save you, not primarily to keep you from going to hell, he wants to save you so that he can conform you or to change you, to make you to become just like Jesus. Is it worth it? 